Steven Spielberg is arguably the greatest director of all time, from Jaws and Close Encounters to Indiana Jones, E.T., and Jurassic Park. No other director has as many hits at the box office that were also massive pop cultural landmarks. However, over the course of his illustrious career, there are several films and sequels that went unmade, which likely would have found their place alongside his other blockbuster hits had they been brought to life. So let's dive in and take a look at what could have been Steven Spielberg's unmade films. Before Jaws, TV advertising for movies was practically non-existent, with new films being marketed mostly in print ads. Not only that, but before The Godfather, a few years earlier, films had rolling releases, meaning they played at a few first-run theaters in major markets for a specified number of weeks, before they made their way down to second and third string theaters as films would slowly find their audience. The result of this was that it would take a lot of time for studios to recoup their investment on these movies, as revenue from theaters would trickle back to the studio very slowly, over months and sometimes even years. Jaws, on the other hand, was the first film to do two things. One, aggressively advertise the film on TV leading up to opening weekend. Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfus from the best selling novel Jaws, rated PG, maybe too intense for younger children and two, get the film in as many theaters as possible for opening weekend. And the result was a massive opening weekend gross, allowing the studio to recoup its investment considerably faster, as studios now focused on centering their marketing on a big release at the end of June and beginning of July. Today, we know it as a summer blockbuster, but Jaws was the first to do it. However, during production on the film, nobody thought it would be the massive hit and cultural phenomenon it became, including Spielberg himself. And that's because the shoot was plagued problems going way over schedule and budget. The experience of making Jaws was, was horrendous for me because the shark was frustrating. It, it didn't really work all the time. It didn't work hardly at all. I've been here 105 shooting days. Uh, and we were only scheduled for something like 65 or 70. As a result of this, Spielberg was keen to set up his next movie and secure himself a job before Jaws even came out and bombed like he thought it would. And while he was trying to get Close Encounters set up at Columbia, he was worried they'd never greenlight the picture. So instead, Spielberg began circling a small sports comedy film called The Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings, about a black barnstorming ball club during the era of racial segregation in the 1930s. However, as Jaws Jaws went from looking extremely iffy to looking like a massive hit, Spielberg lost interest in Bingo Long as he drifted back to the film he really wanted to make, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And to get a green lit, Spielberg marched into the offices at Columbia and shook those Jaws box office receipts at them, forcing them to green light the picture. And its success would firmly establish Spielberg as the king of blockbusters, as he wouldn't direct anything that wasn't one until 10 years later, when he began challenging himself with more serious and mature films. Nobody wanted to make Close Encounters and so Jaws was a phenomenon, and then everybody wanted to make Close Encounters. After the unprecedented success of Jaws, a sequel was inevitable. However, Spielberg wasn't interested for two reasons. First of all, he had an awful time making the first film, and since then, any director going to him seeking advice for filming on water has been advised by him to avoid it altogether. So if you ever wondered why Hook is shot entirely on a soundstage and why the Jolly Roger never leaves port, there's your answer. You probably noticed I haven't done very many water movies since Jaws. It's twice Ice is slow shooting at sea as it is shooting on land. The second reason is because back in the 70s, sequels were mostly seen as tacky and lowbrow, with Godfather Part 2 being the exception at the time. Airport 77. Bigger, more exciting than Airport 75. Although just like Spielberg, Coppola didn't want to make a sequel to his hit film at first either. Plus, Spielberg felt he had been there, done that, and already directed the definitive shark movie. As Universal began shooting the sequel without him, they found themselves at odds with the inexperienced director they hired, John D. Hancock, eventually firing him and going back to Spielberg. At this point, Spielberg had a change of heart, as he came up with an idea that wouldn't just be a retread of the first film, which is what Jaws 2 eventually became. I think we may have another shark problem. Are you serious? In fact, it would have been a prequel, as Spielberg spent the weekend hammering out a screenplay based on Quint's USS Indianapolis speech. So, 1,100 men went in the war, 316 men come out, the sharks took the rest June the 29th, 1945. Ironically, this speech was a last-minute addition to the first film, conceived by Howard Sackler and written by John Milius. John Milius wrote a nine-page monologue for um, Quint to say. And then when Robert Shaw, who himself was a writer of The Man in the Glass Booth, read Milius' 10 page, he says, I can't go on for 10, 15 minutes just talking. Let me have a crack at it. 
Shaw took the speech and, and, and himself edited it down to five pages. Up until Jaws, the events surrounding the USS Indianapolis and its demise weren't publicly known, as the ship was on a top secret mission to deliver enriched uranium and other atomic bomb components to Tinian for the assembly of the Little Boy Bomb, which would be dropped on Hiroshima a few weeks later. After completing its mission, the ship was struck by two torpedoes fired from a Japanese sub, quickly sinking the Indianapolis, leaving its survivors adrift in the ocean for five days in shark infested waters, as they would be picked off one by one before the remaining survivors were finally rescued. The world learned of the USS Indianapolis through Jaws. Peter's domestic housekeeper called him the day after the movie opened and she said that she wasn't coming into work the next day. And when he said why, she said, my son was on the SS Indianapolis and I never knew how he had died until now. Unfortunately, Spielberg was deep in post-production on Close Encounters and requested Universal postpone the start of Jaws 2 to accommodate his schedule. Universal, however, wasn't willing to move the release date nor continue to pay cast and crew so as to not risk losing them to other projects until Spielberg would become available. We realized that what audiences would really want to see was Chief Brody and his family and we should go back to the island. So that's what we did. And while a film about the events of the USS Indianapolis would be made decades later starring Nicolas Cage, no disrespect to that film, but one can't help but wonder what a version directed by Spielberg would have been like, especially if it found a way to include the great Robert Shaw. While Spielberg was shooting Jaws, his agent kept calling the Salkinds, the producers of Superman, to express Spielberg's eagerness to direct it as his next project. Alexander Salkind, however, was hesitant to hire the young director as he'd heard Spielberg was over budget on Jaws. And while Alexander's son Ilya had seen Spielberg's two previous films and wanted to hire him, Alexander didn't feel any pressure to make a decision, saying, let's wait until Spielberg's big fish opens. However, once Jaws did open and proved to be an enormous smash, the Salkinds went crawling back to Spielberg, who not only was already committed to Close Encounters, but also allegedly held somewhat of a grudge, upset that they passed on him when he was practically begging them for the job. And while a Spielberg-directed Superman would have been something to see, I think things turned out alright, as Richard Donner did an absolutely marvelous job. Job. However, before Richard Donner got the Superman gig, it was offered to Bond director Guy Hamilton, who left The Spy Who Loved Me for a chance to direct it, leaving the Bond director's chair vacant. Spielberg, every bit as much a Bond fan as he was a Superman fan, jumped at the opportunity and called up Cubby Broccoli, Bond's producer, and offered his services to direct. Cubby, however, didn't think Spielberg was right for the part, which is an absolutely insane opinion to have, considering Spielberg would eventually direct several Indiana Jones pictures, which were heavily inspired by Bond. And I said, well, you know what, I've always wanted to direct a James Bond picture. And George, so I, I got that beat. I said, what do you mean? He said, I, I have a better idea. It's called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Then after Close Encounters came out, Spielberg once again called up Broccoli, asking to direct Moonraker. But this time, Cubby wasn't willing to pay Spielberg's salary demands, which had risen considerably following the success of both Jaws and Close Encounters. And just like Universal wanting a sequel to Jaws after its unprecedented success, Columbia also wanted a sequel to Close Encounters. And while Spielberg had no interest in directing a sequel, if Columbia was determined to go ahead with one, he didn't want them to make it without him like Universal did with Jaws, and wanted to at least oversee it. Originally titled Watch the Skies, which was a title initially intended for Close Encounters and was taken from the end of The Thing from Another World. Tell this to everybody wherever they are. Watch the skies. Spielberg based the story on the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter, where a Kentucky family alleged that they had been terrorized by gremlin-like aliens over the course of one horrifying night, a story Spielberg had heard while doing research for Close Encounters. To write it, Spielberg turned to John Sayles, who had written the Jaws spoof Piranha, which Spielberg had loved. Spielberg and Sayles would then change the title to Night Skies after learning someone else owned the rights to watch the skies, before hiring Rick Baker to design and build the aliens. The script to Night Skies was told through the perspective of a family living in a rural farmhouse, with the focus on a teenage girl named Tess and her two younger brothers, Watt, also a teenager, and Jaybird, an autistic 10-year-old boy. Next to their home, five distinct aliens would have landed. As the aliens try to figure out the distinctions between humans and their livestock, they end up terrorizing the family. Jaybird, the human family's young autistic son, eventually befriends Buddy, the kind young alien, who by the end of the film would have been marooned on Earth by the other mean-spirited aliens 
aliens as the film closes on him lost in a field under the shadow of an approaching hawk hunting overhead. Frankly, it's quite a depressing ending, and it moved writer Melissa Matheson to tears while on the set of Raiders, where she was visiting her then boyfriend and future husband, Harrison Ford. Spielberg, grappling with homesickness on the Raider set in Tunisia, was overwhelmed by memories of an alien imaginary friend he created during his childhood following his parents' divorce, coupled with his previous desire to make a semi-autobiographical film about his youth, which would later materialize decades later as The Fablemans, Spielberg began having second thoughts about night skies, and yearned to return to the spirit of Close Encounters and blend it with elements from the autobiographical film he had longed to direct. Working with Spielberg, Melissa Matheson took the subplot from Night Skies, in which Buddy the Alien befriends Jaybird, and wrote E.T. Rick Baker, who had already spent a fortune as he slaved away building animatronic models of the aliens, was furious that the project was shelved and got in a big fight with Spielberg, resulting in Spielberg turning to Carlo Rambaldi, who had previously designed the aliens for Close Encounters to build E.T. And while Night Skies would never be made, it would inspire a few other films besides E.T. The first would be Poltergeist, which was a byproduct of Spielberg approaching Texas Chainsaw Massacre director Toby Hooper with the offer to direct Night Skies, which he declined as he was less interested in extraterrestrials and more interested in the supernatural. This resulted in Hooper and Spielberg redeveloping the film into Poltergeist, which instead of being about a rural family terrorized by aliens was about a suburban family terrorized by the paranormal. It's worth mentioning that Spielberg allegedly ghost-directed most of Poltergeist alongside Hooper. Fittingly, both E.T. and Poltergeist came out in the same summer. Gremlins, produced by Spielberg, would also contain elements from Night Skies, such as short, mean-spirited creatures attacking a family home, with one of those creatures being friendly, wide-eyed, and cute. Plus, the film also features a nod to its roots in the form of a marquee advertising Watch the Skies, co billed with A Boy's Life, the working title for E.T. One month after E.T. came out, Spielberg and Matheson got together again to write a treatment for a sequel that would have brought evil aliens to Earth. Attracted by E.T.'s phone home signal that he and Elliot sent out into space in the first film. These aliens are not only carnivorous, but they're also albino mutated versions of the same species as E.T., and they've been at war with E.T.'s faction for decades. Thinking E.T. has returned, Elliot, his siblings, and their friends bike out to the forest to greet him, only to be abducted by the evil aliens who interrogate them telepathically, demanding to know the whereabouts of the fugitive alien known to the kids as E.T., but whose real name is Zrek. As the kids undergo intense interrogation, Elliot's painful cries echo into outer space. Eventually, E.T. returns, responding to Elliot's cries for help, saves the kids, and reprograms the evil alien ship to leave Earth and travel to a remote corner of the galaxy before E.T. gives another tearful goodbye to Elliot and leaves on his own ship. Now, if the idea of an E.T. sequel taking place mostly on an alien ship as kids get tortured, with E.T. only showing up briefly at the end of the film sounds awful, there's a very good reason for that, and that's because it was done on purpose. Allegedly, Spielberg was contractually obligated to develop a potential sequel idea, and so he submitted one so bad that no one in their right mind would greenlight it. That's also probably why this was written one month after E.T. came out in theaters, so Spielberg could get it over with and move on with his life. Remember, Spielberg is a master when it comes to dealing with studio executives. For example, on Back to the Future, which he produced, when a studio executive sent a memo asking them to change the title of the film to Spaceman from Pluto, Spielberg responded with a memo of his own, saying, Dear Sid, thank you for your most humorous memo of November 14th. We all got a big laugh out of it. Keep them coming. We knew that Sid was too embarrassed to admit that he was serious and we never heard about it again. In respect to a sequel for E.T., Spielberg is on record saying it'll never happen. I remember being seven and staying at his house for the weekend. He was a godfather to me. Right. He said, no, we're, we're never going to make a sequel. It's just as it is. And uh, that was his philosophy. However, the closest we would get would be a 2019 commercial for Comcast's Xfinity TV service, which saw E.T. return to Earth to meet a grown-up Elliot and his family. After Warner Brothers acquired the rights to Harry Potter, Spielberg was not only the obvious choice to direct the first book in the series, but the number one choice as well. However, because of all the wizardry involved in the books, Spielberg felt that the film would be very effects-heavy. Combined with the fact that Pixar had proved that animated films could be extremely successful, led him to want to 
to make a version of Harry Potter that was computer animated. Not only that, but he also wanted to combine a few of the books into one movie, and cast American actor Haley Joel Osment as the voice of Harry. All of these ideas clashed with Warner Brothers' plan for a live-action adaptation of each book, as well as J.K. Rowling's preference for a strictly British and Irish cast. Spielberg eventually passed on the project, saying directing it posed no challenge due to the already enormous popularity of the books. Instead, Spielberg would go on to direct AI, Artificial Intelligence, with Haley Joel Osment. However, years later, he would direct a motion capture computer animated adaptation of The Adventures of Tintin, which would give a glimpse into what his version of Harry Potter may have been like. Spielberg's most personal and prolific film is Schindler's List, and it's also the film that earned him his first Oscar. However, if history were a little different, Spielberg may have won that little gold statue a few years earlier, as originally he was attached to direct Rain Man, which would go on to win Best Director and Best Picture at the Oscars. Unfortunately for Spielberg, he made a commitment to his friend George Lucas that he was unwilling to break. When George and I were in Hawaii, and I agreed to direct Raiders, George said that if I did wind up directing the first one, that I would need to direct three of them. He said he had three stories in mind. And that third movie, The Last Crusade, was just about to go into production, forcing Spielberg to leave Rain Man to fulfill his commitment to Lucas. The film began winning Best Picture and Best Writer and Best Act. I kept thinking, God, you know, maybe I should, should have forgotten my entire friendship with George Lucas and said, George, go hire somebody else to do an E3, and I should have done that. Of course I thought about that. But then I, I also thought, Realistically, I have a very strange relationship with Hollywood, and practically speaking, if my name had been on the Rain Man, shot for shot, what Barry had done, if simply my name had been substituted for his, I probably, in my heart of hearts, don't think I would even have been nominated as, to, as director. And Spielberg says that because earlier in his career, he was frequently and unfairly snubbed by the Academy. I didn't get it. I wasn't nominated. As he wouldn't be nominated for Best Director for Jaws, which got four Oscar nominations and was up for Best Picture, Empire of the Sun, which got six nominations, and The Color Purple, which received 11 nominations. The fact that Spielberg wasn't nominated for Best Director for any of these films is absolutely absurd. I, it's the one thing that I cannot comprehend yet in my head, how a best picture can be nominated and yet the director who is basically responsible for it does not get the nomination. And while he'd finally win the Oscar for Schindler's List, with one audience member yelling out during his acceptance speech, Spielberg nearly didn't even direct it, as he was unsure if he was mature enough to make a film about the Holocaust, offering the film to Martin Scorsese instead. However, Spielberg would have a change of heart, and made a deal with Scorsese, trading Cape Fear, which Spielberg was attached to direct, for Schindler's List. And while there's tons of other films, ideas, and books Spielberg has toyed with directing over the years, one of the most notable recent projects that he developed and almost directed was Interstellar. However, we already made an entire video devoted to what Spielberg's version of Interstellar would have been like, so if you'd like to check that out, simply click the link in the top right hand corner, which will take you to the video. Or just wait for a link on the end screen, which is coming right up. Thanks for watching, everybody, and don't forget to like and subscribe to Bullets and Blockbusters for more great content.